Uh, this is fundamentals test three hazardous materials include all of the following except what? Water. Duh, everybody knows water is not hazardous. Although dihydrogen monoxide is pretty bad. Um, but that's water, by the way. To determine if a product or substance being used is hazardous, what are you supposed to consult? EPA. Actually, you're supposed to look at a material safety data sheet. There's a box outside here on the wall. You need to, you know, you can see that. But you can also look at the back of the can if you've got a spray can or something. It'll have an MSDS number and it'll tell you what you need to do. I don't know if this silly little thing of wipes would have or not. But it tells you like if you swallow them or something like that, what kind of problem you got. There, there's an MSDS number usually so that you'll know whether to induce vomiting or whether not to, whether to drink water, whether not to, if you swallow it or something. Um, exposure to asbestos dust can cause what? Mesothelioma. Mesothelioma. Who hasn't seen a commercial about mesothelioma and asbestos, you know? And um, that's number, the, number three is B. All of the above are possible, actually. Asbestosis, lung cancer, mesothelioma. I love mesothelioma. So these questions are jumbled, but that, I mean, the answers are, but all of the above is the one you should be putting for that. Wet asbestos dust is considered to be what? Solid waste. Solid waste, that's all, because what it does is it just washes away. You don't ever blow asbestos dust off with an air hose. You always make sure you hit it with something wet. I don't care if it's brake parts cleaner or if it's soapy water or whatever, just make sure that you get it wet because wet dust can't fly. An oil filter should be hot drained for how long before disposing of it? 12 hours. 12 hours is what this thing says. The guy that came one time and was talking to me from the state of Alabama, he's wearing a hard hat and had a clipboard and he was, you know, writing stuff up. He said uh, 24 hours and then you could throw them in the trash. This says 12 hours. Um, we put them in a drum and safety clean comes and gets the drum so we don't throw them in the trash So we don't have to poke holes in them and drain them used oil engine oil should be disposed of by all of these methods except what? A shipped off site for recycling B burned on site in a waste oil approved heater C burned off site in a waste oil approved heater D disposed of in regular trash. We don't want to put it in the regular trash That's why your part stores have all got you know, they got big oil tanks where you can bring your oil in the airport um, Good idea. Now these these weight these heaters are really good. They got these big old heaters that you can use. You burn your waste oil in, and it provides really good heat for the shop. And technically, it's something that doesn't cost anything to operate, but it keeps the shop warm. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, number seven, the thread pitch of a volt bolt, of a bolt is measured in what units? Or fractions of an inch. It's actually, uh, did you, you said uh, D, didn't you? Yeah. yeah, both A and B can be correct. It depends on what's metric or standard. If it's metric, it's measured how many millimeters it is from the top of one thread to the next. And on a uh, standard, it's how many turns it goes in an inch. Um, technician A says the diameter of a bolt is the same as the wrench size used to remove or install the fastener. That ain't right, is it? Technician B says that the length is measured from the top of the head of the bolt to the end of the bolt. Neither one of those guys are right. Thank you, Mr. Telephone. Nobody calls me unless I'm trying to talk in here. Hey, Rebecca, what's up? All right. All right. I don't like them. I mean, I don't like them. You know, I mean, is there, there's so much proprietary junk that they've got on those things. They're just really aggravating. Uh, they're prone to, you know, there's one sitting out here that Eddie brought up here that had been underwater. Uh, you know, and the guy wants us to tighten a couple of screws and change out a couple of controllers and get him going again. Ain't happening. The thing will sit there until it rots, you know, because the guy don't want to spend the money to get it fixed. You know, so uh, I'd stay away from one of those with all due respect to everybody involved, you know. Yeah, if, unless she's selling it really, really cheap and you're willing to use it for a disposable car, I would not buy that one. Yeah, how much is it? Uh, what what year model is it? Yeah, well, uh, just go into that with your eyes open because uh, those are really aggravating to work on. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Let me see here. Uh, the grade of a fastener, such as a bolt, is the measure of its what? Tensile. Now, what is tensile strength? 
Somebody tell me what tensile strength is. The amount of, amount of pressure you can take before it snaps? Pulling. Oh. How strong is it this way? Now, there's a, it's a different if you're talking about shearing it off, but tensile strength is like if you're trying to pull it apart. Now, one time when I was working in that, for that company down in Texas when I was about 20 years old, they said, uh, they told me to go fix this uh, truck. We had actually sold this 71 Chevrolet pickup, not with a ton and a half, I'm sorry. That was a big job. Uh, they had this 1,500 gallon fuel tank, you know, the big, like the, you see that they haul gas in. Mm -hmm. And they wanted it put on the truck and they wanted it piped and they wanted a power takeoff put on the transmission with the, you know, and all this stuff. So I had to do all that. I got all that done. And um, they drove it to, uh, they were driving it through the oil refinery after they filled it up with fuel two or three months later. And the uh, outside rear, I mean, the outside bearing froze up and twisted the end off the spindle on the left front wheel. And it wiped all the brake parts off. It had drum brakes. Wiped all the brake parts off all the way back to the baggage plate. And then they had to haul it down there with a wrecker. And they said, take your purchase order book and go to Beaumont to the airport and fix that truck. <laughs> so, you know, I had to put myself in. I had to go out there and I had, to, I had to go all over Beaumont looking for a spindle. And I had to, you know, get all the brake parts, the backing plate, the drum. I mean, not while the drum was still around. It was bolted to the wheel. Uh, but all of that stuff had to be replaced out there on a cold day in January when the wind was blowing and there was a little bit of mist in the air and it was just lots of fun. And I got two bolts, quarter inch bolts. I pulled the cap off where the kingpin went. The kingpin is what the spindle swings on on the little truck. And one of the bolts, they were both grade five. One of them was Lake Erie, L-E, Lake Erie that was only stamped on the head of it. And the other one, one of these Chinese bolts had a triangle on it. And I had a steering wheel puller in my toolbox because I just carried my whole toolbox out on the back of my pickup truck. And I put them two bolts in there and I put that steering wheel puller on there and I started applying pressure. I drove the little peg out that held the kingpin in there, you know. I mean, it kind of went in there through a little, it's a wedge shaped thing. It goes in one side of the thing and there she is again. But anyway, long and short of it was one of those things uh, stretched and the other one didn't. The Chinese, one stretched. the Chinese one stretched and the Lake Erie one didn't and they were both the same grade. Yeah. 2006. Um, that you can, yeah, you you can do what you want to, but I would stay completely away from anything that had that nameplate on it. Hmm. Yeah, they, she needs to sell that to somebody else. I mean, that would be my that's my advice. If you want my advice, let her sell it to somebody else. A lot of people, a lot of people would want to buy that one, uh, but from my perspective, even even knowing what I know, uh, I would I would stay away. You know, people that if you, they're really fun as long as you're driving them, but as soon as they need some work done, it's like you better get your wallet out. You know, it's just one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. He's uh he's on he's on the right target, but uh, anyway. All right, <laughs> all right. Let me let me finish this lecture. I'm doing. But the point I'm trying to make is the tensile strength of those two bolts. Why does this thing not leave me alone? Hey, Wendy. Hey. Uh, in about 35 minutes. All right. Alrighty. I'm turning off the ringer on that phone. They don't usually bother me like that. Okay. Um, now then. The, uh, the tensile strength of a bolt is really important. Lake Erie puts their uh, uh, name on it so you know who made the bolt if it pops. The one that's got the triangle on it that was made in China, you have no earthly idea who made it. If it comes apart and something bad happens, you see the bolt, who puts whose bolt was this? I don't know. Um, which of the following is a metric bolt? 5 sixteenths by 18, half inch by 20, 8 millimeter, M12 by 1 and a half. What do you think? D. What is uh, the wrong with eight millimeter? Doesn't tell you the length of it. Doesn't tell you the thread pitch. You're looking. That's M12 by one and a half. The thread pitch. That's the diameter of the bolt plus the thread pitch. That's what you need to know. That's what I was telling uh, Amber and a couple of other people. There several of y'all guys I've talked to about that, and also uh, Miss Holloway over there. The 
if you call on the phone and you're talking to somebody on the phone and you want a bolt like this one right here and you don't know what thread pitch and what size to tell them and you can't lay it on the counter and say, give me one like that, you're in a, you're in a hurt. And if it has to be that thread and it has to be the length you can do, they don't care about the wrench size at the parts store, but they want, what they want to know is thread pitch and, you know, diameter and bolt. You better be able to do that. I got, you know, show you how to do that. If you got any questions about it, we run through a little exercise on it. A bolt that's threaded into a casting is often called, and uh, what's it, what do you call that? What do you call a bolt that's threaded into a casting? It's actually a cap screw, which is, you know, that's, I don't really, mm, you don't, you probably won't be talking a lot about that. The marks or the lines on the head of a bolt indicate what? Both B and C, actually the grade and tensile strength. Now, uh, remember, uh, Amber was asking me about that the other day. She says, isn't this the, the grade of the bolt? And it had six lines on it, and I said, that's grade eight. If it's got three lines on it, that's grade five. Can you remember that? Three lines is grade five, six lines is grade eight. That sounds like I'm trying to confuse you, doesn't it? That's the way it is. Huh? Um, is that B10? I'm not sure, but I, do, I will tell you that they're crazy about them lines. If I was setting that system up, I would put five lines for grade five and I would put eight lines for grade eight. You know, and they may be a grade 10. This one right here, see that little, that one right there? That one is basically a caliper screw, but it's hard to get it to where the camera can focus on it. But it's actually got six little lines on it and that's a grade eight. Hey, yeah, my key is, it, your key's in my office. You'll see it laying in there and I think you're parked out. Where'd you park her out there? And you, we put a sticker and everything, and it needed okay. an oil change really bad. Do I need anything to take Stacy? Nah, I'd ship with it. Okay, no thank problem. you. All right. Um, let me see. Um, when working with hand tools, always do what? Pull. They say pull, don't push, but I'm sorry. You Sometimes you have to push. You know, if anybody's worked on anything, you know, the people that have never used a wrench will tell you always pull it, don't push. But how many times have you found yourself in a position where you cannot pull the wrench? A lot. Yeah, all the time, you know. The proper term for channel locks is what? <laughs> Multi-groove adjustable pliers. Duh. And what about vice grips? What do you call them? Locking uh, those pliers. are locking pliers. What tool is listed as a brand name? Monkey wrench. No, vice grips. <laughs> we got a monkey wrench out here. Uh, Two technicians are discussing torque wrenches. Technician A says the torque wrench is capable of tightening a fastener with more torque than a conventional breaker bar or a ratchet. Pause. Technician B says a torque wrench should be calibrated regularly for the most accurate results. True. That's actually going to be B. Uh, what type of screwdriver should be used if there's very limited space above the head of the fastener? Offset screwdriver, but please, you know, I hate them doggone things. You know. You know, you know how much fun it is if you got one that's hard to turn all the way out and you haven't used an offset screwdriver, you know? <laughs> It'd take a long time. What type of, we're going to go on to fundamentals test four now. What type of socket should be used with an impact wrench? What's the right one? What's the one you're supposed to use? Point. The black. No, come on. The black one. Furthermore, if you put a 12 point on something, you know to say you don't hardly ever see, uh, unless it's made to turn a 12 point, well, you won't see a 12 point impact socket. They're always six point. And uh, what's the difference between the black socket and the chrome socket? Hmm? The Malle malleable steel. That means it can take a beating without busting all the pieces. Um, Technician A says impact sockets have thicker walls than conventional sockets. Well, that's pretty true. Technician B says impact sockets have a black oxide finish. That's true too. Two technicians are discussing the use of a typical bench pedestal mounted grinder. Technician A says a wire brush wheel can be used to clean threads. You guys ever clean threads with a wire wheel? Mm -hmm. Technician, it also will remove your fingerprint if you happen to get your finger in there, if you notice that. If you wanted to get rid of your fingerprint, let's sand it right off there, right? Um, let's see. Uh, technician B says grinding stone can be used to clean threads. Now, what I have done, what I have done in a situation where I've got, let's say I've got a bolt and it's damaged on the end a little bit or I've had to cut it off or something, I will take it and I'll take and I'll put it at an angle on the grinding stone and go, you know, just head it 
spin it all the way around at about a 45 degree, and then I'll hit it on the wire brush and spin it again. And usually you have made you a nice starting thread by doing that. Um, now I've actually, also if you're in a situation where your threads are a little bit boogered up and you're kind of wanting to do something that will work good, you can take that high speed cutter and cut some vertical slots across the threads in about four or five places and you've made your bolts into a thread chaser. You know, if there's some thread issues in the hole. And Jimmy was telling me the other day he had a, a expedition or something that came in there that had messed up threads in the spark in the head because somebody had just screwed it part of the way, a plug part of the way down in there and cross threaded it. And they were asking Jimmy to see what he could do <laughs> with that. And um, so, you know, you take air and you start it blowing in the cylinder and uh, he got a uh, spark plug and he used his high speed cutter and he made it into a thread chaser and he went in there straight with it and fixed those threads and left that plug in there. And it drove off and ran real good and he had it going in just a little while. But uh, you know, you could actually go crazy and do all of this other stuff and you know, make a lot of trouble, but he just put that plug in there and got it going. But he says, I remember you teaching me that in school. He says, and it works really good whenever you know how to do it, you know. Blow air in the throttle body with the uh, intake, intake valve open. And then air will be coming out while you're doing this. And then, as you know, like if you're having to run a tap down in there in a spark plug hole, if air is coming back out the whole time you're doing it, every little piece that breaks off will come back out and won't go down in there. See what I mean? All right. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, hydraulic press is being used to separate a bearing from a shaft. What should be used to cover the bearing during the pressing operation? This is a sort of a standard practice. Uh, well, three was basically, uh, number three, if you answer it the way the answer key wants, you'll just put A, but what they mean is you can't take the threads and go on the wheel, you'll mess them up, but you can touch the corner of them, that's what I was getting at, so yeah, three was, three was the only hydraulic press. If you're going to be really, really safe, and you don't want anything that explodes off of a, a bearing to come and come after you, you can set a brake drum over it. Um, most, most of the time, if you, you can go in shops all over the place and you're not typically going to see people doing that, but that's, that's the wise way to do it. I was pressing something with a press one time a long time ago, uh, years ago when I was working down in Texas, and there was something that came off of that thing uh, like a bullet and it went into my shoulder, poof, and I guess it's still in there. But I mean, I felt something hit me in the shoulder and I looked and there was a little place and you could tell it had gone in, it broke the skin and gone under the meat, you know. And I figured since it was just steel, it wouldn't matter anyway, you know, because I'm mostly made of steel anyway. All right. Um, so a brake drum. Air impact wrenches should be used with... <laughs> Come on, y'all. Dry air. That's why we got a big old thing back here behind the shop with next to the air compressor. You know, that thing that runs back here all the time it looks like a big central unit. Boom. It's a dryer. And it keeps the, the air is 100% dry coming out of that thing. It ain't got an area bit of moisture in it. When I was at the Volkswagen place over there, um, there was uh, the, all kinds of water in that air system. And you plug your tool in, you know, every service bay had its own air outlet and all that. And uh, I was working over there in the service bay on the side. And I, and I noticed every time I plug my impact wrench, I pull a trigger, it would just blow a bunch of water through it, you know. And I says, and I had a dryer with half inch pipe thread on it and I had a gate valve and I told David uh, the guy I graduated from high school with him he was a service manager I said David I need to put a dryer on here he said well, we're not going to shut the whole shop's air down just so you can put a dryer on your airline and I says well I can put it on there with the air going and so I screwed the end off of that thing and while it was blasting air out of there I screwed my I opened my gate valve and I screwed it on there and then I put my dryer on there you know I closed the gate valve put the dryer on there and hooked the air hose back up and I had a nice dry air but this business about we will shut the air down while you put a dryer on there. You know, it didn't take me two minutes to do it, you know. But anyway, I, I hate that kind of stuff. Of course, the Smitty, the other mechanic worker, he said, well, I've been blowing air through all my, water through all my air tools for 10 or 12 years. Just never, but I just don't like it. I don't like blowing air through my tools like that, you know. I mean, water through my air tools. Um, technician A says incandescent trouble lights may be used when working around gasoline. Technician B says fluorescent trouble lights should be used when working around gasoline. B, incandescent, 
if you splatter, have you ever uh, splattered water or dripped water on a incandescent bulb and seen it bust? Oh yeah, boy, I have. I have. Yeah, and what it does, it'll, it'll, it, it breaks, and then as soon as it shatters, that uh, filament starts smoking and gets really hot and burns up. Well, if you've got gasoline there, and that happens, this one guy that I heard about, I, I wasn't in on this deal, he saw gas dripping on a drop light when he was working, and he knew something bad was about to happen. And so he, he jumped up and he ran for the door, and about the time he got back, I mean, just outside the door, that thing goes boom, and it sucked him back in. <laughs> But he never stopped running. You know, it pulled him back in, and then he kept running, and the flames all came out. <laughs> but it was gas dripping on an incandescent drop light. I mean, he saw that start happening. Apparently, it started spraying, and it started dripping, and he knew there was, the safest thing he could do was get the heck out of there. And it was a great big explosion. You know, it looked like, you know, something off a movie. But uh, he said he literally pulled him back. You know, the, the, the force of it did, you know. Like, he probably saw that kind of stuff when you were overseas. <laughs> but... Um, all right, let's see. Uh, what's the best location to measure or service the engine block? Ding, 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 ding. It's out mounted on an engine stand. Um, although we have worked, uh, worked on them hanging from the hoist, you know, whenever we were doing some things to them. Uh, to check a crankshaft journal for taper, the journal should be measured in how many locations? Somebody give me an answer. That's D. Three locations, actually. Taper. What's taper? Skinnier on one side than it is on the other. In other words, if you measure in down the tube, I mean, or down the, across it, if it's bigger on one end than it is the other, but you're measuring it, I could draw it like that. Uh, but this right here, incidentally, is tapered. It's bigger here than it is there because pipe threads like that. This is half inch pipe, and it's bigger there than it is there. That's the tapered threads. And it's possible for a crankshaft <laughs> journal to be tapered. You gotta make sure it's not. A telescopic gauge can be used to measure a cylinder bore if what other measuring device is used to measure the telescopic gauge. Now, a telescopic gauge, I've got some of those in there. It's basically, it's got little, you know, you, know, you tighten this up. You put it down in there so that it's like, I could actually. Can you use a straight edge? What do we mean? It's actually a T-shaped thing. And it's got a barrel. And you put it in there, and it's kind of round on each end. And these will slide up in there. And whenever you put it like that, and then you break it back, you got this snug enough where when it goes back to the smallest reading, it'll stay there. You pull it out of there and you use your mic to measure it. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't like that. I'd rather do it another way. If there's a middleman at work there. You know, you're measuring it with this, then you're measuring this with your mic. That just always seems like kind of a silly way to do that to me. And I don't know how accurate it would be, really. But I've got a gauge that measures cylinder bores out there that's made just for measuring cylinder bores. But you've got to know how to set it up. That's the other thing. It's a little easier to use uh, if you're just going to measure one cylinder bore right quick to use this snap gauge thing. Uh, you know, that, um, that they're talking about. But anyway, you're going to have to measure it with a micrometer. That's number nine. Which metric unit of measure is used for volume measurement? Hmm? What? CC. CC. All right. Now, um, if I am going to find out how they came up with these measurements. Remember this and burn it in, okay? Because uh, you may get, you may be on a game show one day. A cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. You got that? A cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. That's like the um, weight of a paper cup. A thousand cubic centimeters weighs how much? A kilogram. Which is? 2.2 pounds. All right. An ounce of water weighs how much? That's going to the welding department. Can you tell me where that's at? Two buildings over. So what do I need to go back out? No, you can go around. 
Yeah, welding? Go, yeah, go around over. You see the welding department over okay, there. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Sable steel. He must not have been here before. Um, but anyway, uh, so a, a cubic, I mean, an ounce of water weighs how much? An ounce. 16 ounces of water weighs how much? A pound. You get me? If the met, whether you're talking about the metric system or imperial, water is the standard for weight. You know that? You got that? Did you burn it in? Everybody, what's the deer in the headlights about? You know, what's all that? That's what I get from her when I say, here, now you have to do this. And she goes, you know, all right. Let me see here. So remember a cubic centimeter. Okay, so if I've got a six liter engine, how many cubic centimeters is that? How many cubic centimeters are there in a liter? A thousand? That's 6,000 cubic centimeters. How many of you guys ever rode motorcycles? You know, you got your little 125, you got your 250, you got your 350. That's how many cc's the displacement the engine's got. Uh, and so, uh, which of these objects have a mass of approximately one gram? I just said it a minute ago. Wait, did we do number? 11? No. We missed 11? Oh, a dial indicator can be used to measure what? Crankshaft end play. It can't measure the thickness of rings, bore diameter, or piston ring side clearance, but it can be used to measure crankshaft end play. Uh, you don't usually do that a whole lot, but, you know. Uh, which of these objects have a mass of approximately one gram? Paper clip. Paper clip on push rod engines. Camshaft journal diameter often does what toward the rear of the engine? Neither. Decreases. The camshaft, see that, see that camshaft right there? See the journals on the camshaft? It's not the crankshaft, the camshaft. Look oh, right there. Oh, my bad. Yeah. When you're, you better, whenever you're putting cam bearings in one, um, and we've got, you know, there's a tool back there for that. There was actually a sheet on it that I don't know how many people did last semester. But uh, cam bearings are going to be marked on a lot of engines. They're going to be smaller on the back than they are on the front. Why is that? You ever think about that? They all look about alike, but they're not. You can actually look at the uh, specs for the, for the journals on that camshaft and going toward the back of the engine on more engines than you think, they get smaller going, I mean, the back one is smaller than the one in front of it, and the farther you move toward the front so of the engine. Put yeah, that's a good answer. You, I mean, whenever you're putting it in there, you know, the, the front uh, journal is the biggest one, you know, and imagine yourself if you just, what I always do is I think about it, if I got one this size, I got one that size, I got one that size, and I got one that size, it's fairly easy to stick that thing in there. But if they're all dead on the money the same size, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of aggravating to put it in there. Also, it's easier for them to machine it that way. But anyway, that's uh, we put a camshaft in a, a camshaft, set of cam bearings in a Jeep one time. And the uh, students that were working on it, I was kind of watching them. And uh, they were looking at the specs in the book, and they said, these aren't all the same size. Now, when you get them from Jeep, like if you get them from Chrysler, they're color-coded. So that you'll know that the different ones, yellow, red, you know, all this kind of stuff goes. But whenever you get them from perfect circle, each cam bearing has a different part number stamped on it. And you know, cam bearings are a full circle. They look like little serviette rings that you'd put a napkin through, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, whenever you put them in there, you gotta, there's, there's like I say, there's a special tool back here that's just for putting them in. That's all it's for. Um, all right, uh, where would you usually find <coughs> wiring diagrams? Nope, excuse me. Uh, the best tool to measure clearance between two components is what? Filler gauge. Filler gauge, wiring diagrams are usually where? Factory service. Exploded views of components may be found where? Service manual. Service manual. Uh, technician A says electronic service information may be expensive to access. Technician B says electronic service information systems can save time because they can be searched quickly. Those 
let's see. What's the free internet site that contains case studies of problems and successful repairs? We talked about That's going to be the IATN number of the day and the date of the calendar year is known as what? That's the Julian date. And which section of a service manual includes onboard diagnostic information? 